parenting is not an 18-year engineering project. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmette We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Today's podcast is brought to you by Beekeepers Naturals, the company on a mission to reinvent your medicine cabinet by creating clean and natural remedies that actually work. I started using Beekeepers Naturals a couple years ago after hearing about them on a podcast. And I just loved how effective they worked, their clean, non-toxic and natural ingredients, the company's obsessive research and their pesticide testing, as well as their mission to support the pollinators. I just started using their propolis spray and I absolutely love it. The throat spray is really your daily dose of defense when it comes to naturally supporting your immune system and soothing a scratchy throat. With just three simple ingredients, the spray is powered by sustainably sourced bee propolis, an incredible germ fighter that contains over 300 beneficial compounds. It's exactly what your body needs during cold and flu season. And I just love this spray. I use it every morning. It's super easy to use. I just spray it like right in my mouth and off I go and it tastes good. And um, I love how they do all this research and testing and their remedies are so clean and effective. Another product we love is the Bee Chill Honey. We all get stressed out, right? But a dose of the Bee Chill can help take the edge off. It's great at bedtime. You can put a spoonful of it in your tea to help you toss and turn less. I've actually been doing that most nights. I've been putting a little scoop in my tea and mixing it up and it tastes so good and it's so calming. And it just, I love having that at the end of the night to just kind of relax me before I go to bed. And a couple other of their honey products are so great. You can buy the Bee Chill in travel size sticks. And so I recently went on a trip and brought it with me. I used it in my tea. I use it in my plain yogurt. And I just have to add that their superfood cacao honey is delicious. I make these chocolate protein balls with it, and they're so good. I actually just made them last night. Now that we're going into winter, it's a great time to upgrade your medicine cabinet and stock it with immune-supporting products. To save 15% off on your first order, go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash artoflivingwell. That's B-E-E. K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S dot com slash A-R-T-O-F-L-I-V-I-N-G-W-E-L-L to save 15% off. Simply enter the code Art of Living Well at checkout and shop now for 15% off our favorite immune supporting products that your whole family will love. Hi, before we jump right into today's conversation, we wanted to share a couple of important updates. We are starting our own Art of Living Well book club, and we would love for you to join us in reading the last Law of Attraction book you'll ever need to read by Andrew Cap, who was on episode number 45 of our podcast, and we'll be hosting a discussion on the book on November 12th at 1130 Central Time, and you can click the link in the show notes to sign up for this free event. And then the next update is an exciting program that we just developed. It's a 30-day Thrive During the Holiday Season program, and it's going to run from November 16th to December 13th, and it's going to be all about staying festive, fun, and feeling fabulous during this holiday season, which I know is going to look and feel very different than it has in years past, but it'll be a private community where you will receive mindset tips, recipes, weekly lives, and so much more with a group of other like-minded people. And we would absolutely love to have you join us. And you can head on over to the link in the show notes and, of course, message us or reach out with any questions. 
And then finally, we would love for you to rate and review this podcast. If you are enjoying these episodes, please head over to Apple Podcast and give the Art of Living Well podcast a rating and review. Doing so really helps our podcast get found in searches so that more people can benefit from the information and all of the interviews that we share. And of course, if you're enjoying an episode, please feel free to share it with anyone you think may benefit from the information and tag us on social media. And now let's jump right into today's conversation. Hello and welcome to episode number 50 of the Art of Living Well podcast. We are thrilled to bring you today's guest, Sue Groner, an experienced mother, certified positive discipline parent educator, and author of her new book, Parenting with Sanity and Joy, 101 Simple Strategies. Sue is passionate about helping parents be happier and more relaxed. And who doesn't want to be happy and relaxed, even during those challenging parenting moments? Sue believes that what you view as problems that need fixing are, in fact, opportunities for your kids. And we dive into so many of her tips and strategies today. This conversation just flew by for us. As an experienced mother, Sue knows how stressful and overwhelming parenting can be at times. She founded the Parenting Mentor to provide an ally for parents in their quest to raise confident and resilient children. Sue is also the creator of The Clear Method of Parenting, developed through years of trial and her fair share of errors with her own family. Clear adheres to the belief that parenting strategies should be grounded on six important pillars, communication, love, empathy, awareness, rules, and respect. This has become the cornerstone of her practice as the parenting mentor. A graduate of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and a former advertising executive, Sue now resides in New York City and Bedford, New York with her husband, two children when they're not away at school, and their rescue dog. She is available for private, group, and virtual mentorship sessions nationwide for individuals as well as corporations. You are going to love Sue's energy and her approach to parenting in this non-judgmental, very open and collaborative way. Marnie and I got so much out of this conversation, and we can't wait to dive into her new book. So with that, let's jump right in to today's conversation with Sue Groner. Hi, Sue. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Art of Living Well podcast today. We are both so excited to dive in and talk about all things parenting. Marty and I are both parents of three kids, spanning from the age of 10 to 20. And we know many of our listeners are parents and some have younger kids, some have college age or grown adults. And I know that your advice and tips in particular during this current pandemic will be immensely helpful for everyone. I thought we could just get started by maybe sharing a little bit about your background and your story and how you came to be a parent educator. Well, yes, I, my main experience is having been a parent and continuing to be one. I learn every day. I was an anxious, stressed out mom for probably the middle school years, the most. And at some point I took a step back when my kids were in high school and I looked at them and I'm like, wow, they're really like evolving all this stuff that I was so worried about and so stressed out about was such a waste of time. And I realized, like, I wanted to share that with other parents, like, because everyone worries so much or so much fear around, you know, the projection of what our kids are going to be like when they're adults. And so if I can help parents sort of deal with that and learn the strategies of how to handle things that do worry you and do stress you out and the issues you have with your kids, then I'm doing a good job. And, you know, I just started doing it for friends and people I would meet. And everyone started to say after a while, like, you really should turn this into a business. You're good, really good at it. You're really helpful. And so the time was right. And I did. That's That's awesome. awesome. I I can relate to that because I even remember my son, who's now 20, when he was in preschool, I remember like stressing about where he was going to go to kindergarten and it seemed like such a big deal. And when he was going to start reading and we, you know, whatever it is, it seemed like the biggest deal in the world. And then by the third kid, it was kind of like, oh, whatever, like they'll be fine. (laughs) They'll be fine. Exactly. (gasps) Totally. If this um, pandemic would have hit when my oldest was, you know, in elementary school versus my youngest now 
it would have been a totally different situation. I'm like, oh, two months at the end of the year, they only have virtual and they're not getting a whole lot. Oh, it's only two months in their whole education, right? Um, so what did that look like early on for you? Like what was, how were you working with people and how has maybe your practice and your business evolved since the early days? Yeah, so I still work one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, I did work one-on-one -on -one with some people in person. Now everything is completely virtual. And even like my groups are virtual, which is great because I can reach so many more people you know, across the country, I could have a group where people are one, someone's in California and someone's in New York and everybody in between. And the other piece of growth really from my business, aside from more writing is I now work with companies as well. And I kind of took this step back and said, wow, you know, think about all these people who are working full time and they've got all the same worries and stresses and it's got to be taking away from their focus and their engagement at work. And so I started to work with companies with some of them have what's called an ERG employee resource group, which they have family ones or parenting ones. So I'll work with those ERGs or I'll just come in and do a workshop for parents in general, or, you know, now it's virtual again, but I work with Morgan Stanley. I've got a scheduled time with Microsoft and law firms and, you know, everybody needs a little help. You know, and and I also found that there, you know, now there's so much focus on parents with, you know, babies, right? Mm -hmm. Take coming coming back from maternity leave, how they should be treated, expectations, and that you know, ramp up again. But once your kids are like one or two, they kind of forget about you and expect you to just jump right back in. And that's when the, the other kind of worries really begin. And like, well, that's calling the nanny or, you know, what about this activity? Or they got in a fight with their friend and how am I supposed to deal with that? And it's a lot, but there are certain strategies that really help get over that worry. So can we talk about your practice a little bit? I know that it's founded on six important pillars, communication, love, empathy, awareness, rules, and respect. Can you share with us um, what each of these, how you work with them and or incorporate them into your practice and with parents and teaching them about their parenting styles? Yeah, sure. So that's an acronym actually which sounds, it's clear. <laughs> so they call it the clear method because it's just easy to remember and I love acronyms. So I, and I thought about all the things that really mattered to me in approaching any issue with a kid and I wrote them all down and then I was able to turn it into this word. So it, these words are not necessarily in any particular order, but we can start at the end with rules. And I would say, I don't think it's important to have tons of rules, but everyone needs to have some rules. Kids need some boundaries. And without rules, it's really difficult to manage anything in your home. And for instance, I have clients always talking about phone use. My kid's on their phone <laughs> all the time. I can't take it. You know, I don't know what to do. I want to take the phone and throw it out the window. Uh -huh. And my first question is, well, what are your rules around phone use? And well, we don't have any. So I'm like, well, no wonder you're going crazy. You know, <laughs> I think that makes sense. So if you have the rules, then you can say, well, hey, that's our rule. Uh -huh. And you don't have to like, get into an argument all the time with you're on your phone because it's very just when you feel like it's too much and you say that well the your poor kid doesn't know you know it's just on your based on your mood a lot of the time so the rules are really important and, and with rules i say the more you can involve your children in making them the better off everyone's going to be nobody likes to be told what to do it's much more respectful and that's the other R, to talk to your kids about it and say, hey, you know what, let's let's talk about this phone use. You know, we're arguing about it so much. That's not good for any of us. Let's talk about, you know, you know, what do you think is reasonable and a reasonable amount of time to be on the phone every day? And then when you hear what they say, the best response, even if you think it's too much or you think, wow, they really gave us too little amount of time, 
just say, okay, you know what? I don't know how I feel about that, but let's give it a try. Right? That is your that is your friendly phrase for almost anything. Let's give it a try. When you say that, you're not boxing anybody into a corner to make this giant commitment. Right? I mean, just think about it with yourself and your partner, right? And can you do more of this and I'll do more of that and whatever? And like it's not this written in stone. It's like, you know, are you up for giving that a try for a couple of weeks? And then we can talk about it. And it's like you're a team. Yeah, exactly. It's it's collaboration. It's making everyone feel good. Yeah. Not feeling stuck. And, you know, I'm a real fan of the concept of trial and error, Uh not which is in a way the same as failure and mistakes. Uh Failure and mistakes has such, those words have such a negative connotation. Uh And then there's judgment, right? Negative judgment. But trial and error kind of assumes that there's going to be mistakes, that things aren't going to work right the first time. So you then you go back and you try something else and then you go back and you try something else and you either throw it out and start over or you keep tweaking, whatever. And then there's like, it's such a comfortable way of looking at any problem. And it's a great way to help your kids learn to problem solve, which I also feel is really important. But anyway, I love that. It reminds me of like doing a science experiment is kind of what, and I talk to my, I use that term a lot with my kids, probably more as it relates to food, but similar type of concept. It is. It's with anything. I think like the more that we as parents can take judgment out of our vocabulary and it, and it's really hard because a lot of the times we'll say things with love, you know, well, you know, your kid comes home and something happened and go, well, did you, did you call, did you go talk to so-and-so, you know, did you do this? Did you do that? Right. We're like kind of saying, well, here's what you should have. We're saying, why didn't you, you should have, that's what they hear. And so then again, it's judgment. And so if you want to help them through that, say, well, how did you, you know, validate how they felt about whatever that problem was. Wow. That sucks. You know, that must've been really hard for you. But, you know, look, you handled it well, or how might you handle it differently next time? Do you want to brainstorm some ideas together? Again, like brainstorming isn't you telling your kid what they need to do and what they have to do. Uh Brainstorming is saying, hey, I'm here if you want to throw out some ideas together and you can try whatever you want. And I like, it seems like your approach too is asking open-ended questions which seems to be another way, just you're asking them how they feel and what may they have done differently versus asking the yes, no questions that maybe include more judgment or your position into your response to whatever happened. Right. Um, Getting back to clear. So the communication, (laughs) love, empathy, awareness part. I like to start with the awareness part and we can go back to that phone example the awareness of our kids being on the phone is, wow, aren't my kids lucky to be able to be connected 24 seven with their friends? Like, I wish I had had that, you know, I had the phone that, you know, I was allowed to be on for X amount of time and that was it. And now they can have like group chats and everything. And it's like, kids need to be connected and they need to feel connected. And now even more so with the pandemic. So I would always start out a conversation and say, wow, that font that you're so lucky, you know, it's such a great thing that this tool that you can use to be connected with your friends all the time. And I, I love mine too. And I get so much work done on it and I don't waste a lot of time and it's efficient and, and it's fun. And, but I also find it's really good to not be on it sometimes too. Let's talk about those times, you know, and as a family, what are times that you think would be good for us to all be off it, right? And then you come to an agreement together. So, but that's a conversation where you have the awareness of how they feel and the empathy of like, yeah, I know it's hard not to be connected and that you want to be. And then you're talking with love. You're coming from a place of love as opposed to a place of anger and frustration. And the way in which you say this, the communication piece, is the tone and manner. 
And so you can hear in my voice and you can see even I'm smiling when I say these things. And I always say, when you're really angry, just make yourself smile and then say what you want to say. And I swear to God, it's like impossible. Like just go look in the mirror one day and pretend like you're yelling at your kid and smile and try it. <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. But you really can't. And yeah. so you can hear in someone's voice when they're smiling, when they're coming from that place of, like you said, like a team. I'm on to be on the same team as my child. Mm -hmm. And so I want to work with them. I want to help them solve an issue, you know? And as you said, with the asking of the questions, so often, we forget, like, we just want things done. And so the kid who won't take a shower every night, you know, and it's a battle every night, right? So I say to the parent who tells me that, well, what is it about the shower that your kid doesn't like? And they're like, what? I don't know. Like, never, you know, I like, never thought to ask that question because it's just like you, we just assume they just don't feel like it or they don't want to do it at that moment. But it could be a really simple solution. Like, maybe your daughter doesn't like getting her hair wet and was never offered a, a shower cap, right? I mean, it could be that simple. Or maybe it's the timing, like, hey, you know, and you approach it with like, yeah, do you realize that we fight about your shower every night? Like, isn't that crazy? And wow, nighttime should be like a relaxing time before you go to bed. Let's figure this out, honey. Tell me what's bothering you. Do you maybe, I can see sometimes like if you've been relaxing after your work and then all of a sudden you have to go to your, take a shower and get ready for bed. Like maybe after your homework, you go take the shower and then you have that relaxing time. Do you want to try that? I love that. It's just like engaging with your kids and trying to yeah. get to the, the root of what's causing this conflict between the parent and the kid about not wanting to take a shower or too much phone or whatever it is. Whatever it is, you know, whether it's too much video or it's, you know, frustration over one thing or another. And then, you know, you do have to pick your battles. Like you don't want to do this over every single thing. Right. But the more you have this open communication and the more your kids feel like you're not judging them, the more they're going to share with you. And that's the ultimate goal, I think, is that, you know, as they get older and things start happening, that they know if they're not going to be judged, that they can really share with you and get your feedback on things that will help the process. Yes. And I love that. And I think, especially for those people that have middle school to high school age kids, that's so important because that's the time when you want them sharing. You know, when they're little, they just, sometimes they have like right. sharing too much, right? And then all of a sudden it's just, they sort of ease up on that. And that's yeah. when you really want the information. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it's hard to get like, you you know, so, you know, so honey, you know, have, have you tried pot? Have you had a drink? Like you yeah. can't do that. You know, like that's not, <laughs> no one's going to ever say that. Yes. Right. But you can say, hey, I was talking to my camp friend who lives in another state somewhere away. And they, she was telling me how, you know, her son and some of his friends have sort of been experimenting. And, you know, what do you think about that? So then it's like not on them. And then you start a dialogue, you know, and yes. again, you're bringing it up without, can you believe what I heard yes. that they're doing this? Isn't that horrible? versus hey you know I heard that's like what do you think you know I, I I'm sure like that's kind of happened that's around the age where this starts happening and you know have any of your friends or you are you interested are you curious and then you start a conversation well what do you know about it what do you think it does hey why don't we go online and look together right it's interesting because so I have three kids and I feel like I'm pretty much raising them the same way but one of them is a huge talker. One of them is not as much of a sharer, even though I encourage and try and have the conversations in the same way. And then the other one's kind of in the middle. But all three of them are different in terms of how much they are willing to engage and share. So I find that interesting. And I wonder if, you know, 
based on the personality that they have if I need to try and draw more out of the quieter one or the one that's less willing to share? I, you know, I, listen, there are kids, kids are like that. You know, I have the same thing. My daughter talks more to me than my son, but he still shares and never, he's never felt judged. And so he's shared a lot about stuff, but you know, if you, the more you talk about yourself and your own experiences, the more likely to get them to talk also, you know, I always say like kids, like when you, your kid comes home from school, like in, in my book, one of the, in the forbidden phrases chapter, one of them is like, how was your day? What did you do today? Like, and you wouldn't think of that as like a forbidden phrase, but it's like, no one wants to just spew out everything they just did when they just did it. You know, it's like, I went through my day at school or I went like my mom calls me and says, so tell me what you did today. And she did last night. And I said, wow, mom, you know, that's like the worst question she <laughs> said asked me. I'm like, it's even in my book, you know? I'm like, I'm exhausted. I had like a really long day. I had so much work. Like the last thing I want to do is now recount it. You know, but I promise if there's something interesting or exciting, I will share that with you. And it's the same for our kids. And so, you know, I used to like when my kids would, if I picked them up at school, they would get in the car. I learned not to ask that question and I'd say hi. And I, the first thing I said was, do you need a few minutes just to chill and check your phone and download? You know, and often they oh. just wanted that. And I felt like, you know, originally it was like, oh, you know, all I want to do, like, here I am coming to pick you up and blah, blah, blah. But then I'm like, I tried to put myself in their place. And oh. when I asked that question and they were appreciative of that time, I didn't feel angry or upset. I felt good that I was give, respecting them and seeing how they were. And then sometimes I would ask them a question about something and they would go, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, do you not know or do you just don't feel like talking about it now? And they were a little, I just don't, actually I don't feel like talking about it right now. And I said, okay, you know, let's talk about it later. I'd love to hear da da da, but absolutely we can talk about it later. Okay. And that I was, love I that. Respectful. And, and do they typically come back to you and talk about it later or do you have to yeah, bring, we'd bring it, I'd bring it up again or like just, you know, we were in the kitchen and we're having a meal or, you know, I mean, I'm going to totally change that because now that school started again, mm -hmm. I ask that question all the time and none of them really want to talk. And you know what, you're to your point, empathizing with them and thinking about, gosh, I've just been in school all day. Now they've been wearing, you know, our kids are hybrid. They've been wearing a mask all day too. They haven't had a lot of just like freedom really because it's so much you know all these rules have been placed on them and so they just want their downtime just like we would want downtime after a similar day so yeah, and you know i'm gonna start that today okay. if you want to have conversations with your kids like i don't like yes we would all love to be that fly on the wall a lot of the time but you know we're not going to be and that's just that but you can say like, I always, like I said before, say something about your day yourself. Like if something funny happened, say, oh my God, you guys aren't going to believe this. The funniest thing happened. Tell them about it. And then it's going to spark their memory and they go, oh my gosh, well, mm -hmm. you know, when we were in the gym and, or, you know, in this class, this happened and it was like, everyone was dying laughing and then someone else is going to share and it, it'll flow more naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, you could say, Oh, I saw the coolest mask today. Is anybody wearing any crazy masks in school? Like, is there one that you love? Like, what would be the ideal mask for you? You know, and then say, you know, or is it comfortable? You want to find something more like, you know, just engage that way. And you I, never know where that conversation is going to go then. Yes. This is all great advice. This is great advice. And I love that it's like practical. People can literally implement it today when they're listening you know right and you know what nothing none of this is like brain surgery i say and you know you could come up with this on your own if you really took the time to think about it but but who has that time you well, know you're busy you're doing stuff no one everyone's so like we just got to get stuff done and and so when you're in the heat of it when you're in the thick of it uh -huh. you don't have time and you also you know the other thing i i love to say is that i have the benefit of the retroactive crystal ball you know, and so now I can see all that crap I was worried about didn't matter because I know how my kids are now at 21 and 23. But like now, if you could look in that crystal ball and see them as young adults, 
or even as, you know, middle-aged adults and see how they're thriving and flourishing and figured out all these things we were so worried about, you know, that they couldn't sit nicely at the table. And, you know, we were like, oh my God, if they can't sit at the table now, I have to fix this right now. So they'll be able to sit nicely as adults. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we have so much fear about what they're doing now, reflecting how they're going to be as adults. And it's so not true. Like it's, just think about yourselves, ask your partners, you know, what were they like when they were like, you know, 10 or 15 or it's crazy. Like I was talking to someone yesterday and her son is 15 and I'm like, give him a break. He's been on this world for 15 years. That's so nothing. That's so little time. And you know, the brain doesn't fully form until 25. So he's got 10 more years. So like, just let it go and enjoy the process of watching him evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, I think as parents, we have this incredible privilege to kind of stand back more and see how they change each year. Like, it's exciting when you think about it that way. And it's their journey, right? Right. Like, it's their life, their journey, we're guiding them, but it's not our they're, it's not our lives, it's their lives. And, you know, to that point, one of the tips in my book and in perspective, it's like, your child is not a mini me. And, you know, yeah. I remember the moment that that happened, that I realized that, you know, my daughter like wanted to play the piano and wanted to play the piano. And at one point she like, well, she was taking lessons, but she just didn't love practicing. And I went to her and I loved it. When I was a kid, I had to be told to stop practicing. I would play and play and play. And I just assumed like everybody did. You know? And I said to her, what's up? You know, it doesn't seem like you really love this. And she goes, I enjoy it, mom. She goes, and I just don't love it the way you did. And it was like, oh my gosh. For that moment, I'm like, wow, she's not, a, she's not me. Yeah, And I can't expect her to be. And it was such a turning point for me in the way I approached so many things with my kids, with their my expectations for what they were going to be like. It's mm. very helpful. Our kids are they really are their own people with their own likes and dislikes, their own talents and, you know, things they're not great at. And they can be completely different from us, which makes life a lot more interesting also. Absolutely. So can we talk about teens? like? How do you set boundaries and rules with teens? I know you said, you know, kids don't need a lot of rules. And I get the sense that you're going to say maybe you set the rules together with the teens. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm just curious about that. I know, you know, we both, Stephanie and I, have teenagers in our house right now. And there are definitely moments that come up where you're like, how in the world do I handle this? So like, give me an example. Well, you talked about phone usage, which is kind of a big thing. Um, but honestly, just like res them respecting the rules of the house for me. And I know you talk a little bit about chores and, you know, you know, cause I think the teenagers can be a little bit selfish, right? Like that's just the part of their journey. And they're going through that. Like you said, they're only 15 or however many years old they are. And so I think it's part of it. It's like communication and respecting sort of the rules of the house or how they're going to contribute to the household, whatever that looks okay, like. So, yeah. So that's a conversation and that's a very valid conversation. I don't think there's anyone who hasn't wanted to have it because listen, you know, the worst part about being a parent is being a warden right? <laughs> and a nag. And, you know, it's true. Like you don't want to be the phone warden. You don't want to be the video game warden. You don't want to be the homework warden or the food warden or the chore warden. Like mm -hmm. that's not your job. Yes. You know, what our job is though, is instead of, and we have to think of this as a process instead of a result. So the result, if you're thinking about it in terms of result, is that your child needs to empty the dishwasher if that's their job. And that needs to be done, period. The process is helping them learn how to do it without being told to do it mm. and just get used to doing it. And that's more of our job. And then say to your kid, hey, you know what? I hate nagging you about doing the dishwasher. And you must hate hearing me nag you about it too. And maybe there's a list of chores and say, do you just 
hate that. Do you want to switch chores with and do something else instead? Like, okay, so now like we're bringing the whole clear thing into it, right? You're saying, I, I see they're not doing it. Like, what's up with that? I want to understand what it is, you know? Do you hate that you have to do it, you know, by a certain time? Would you rather, like, let's talk about chores. Like everyone in the family needs to do chores. I, and I like to call them family contributions instead because a chore is so, again, a chore is so negative sounding. And a family contributes, hey, you're part of this family. Everyone has to chip in a little bit. Not a ton. I'm not being unreasonable, but there are certain things that just we all need to chip in on. And I, if you want to sit down with your siblings and together we can make a list of the things and maybe you all want to just switch it up every week, every month. We can try it in different ways to see what works. But I don't want to be the one to remind you and nag you and you know so what do you think you could do to remember do you want to bring here we're going to go back to that do you want to brainstorm some ideas to remember they're going to say well i can put a little message on my phone to remind me well that's a great idea why don't you give that a try let's see how that goes for a week or two the end that's the end of the conversation and then you don't say anything for the week or two. And if it's dinner time after dinner and the dishes are need to go in the dishwasher and the dishwasher's not empty, say, oh my gosh, the dishwasher's not empty yet, sweetie. We got to put those dishes in, right? Not, you didn't do it. There's no, like, again, you take the judgment out. It now becomes like you're on their side. Again, it's like, so it didn't get done. So, you know, the same thing with like, you want to have an hour to play video games. I'm willing to give that a try. Here's the rule though, you have to monitor it yourself. How do you think you can do that? Because I know for me, when I start playing a game on my phone or whatever, it's really hard to stop. I get totally lost in it. Sometimes I'll say, I just want to play one more game and then it takes so much longer than I expected. And you know, that must happen to you too. So would you apply that same logic to sleep? I think one of the things that I feel like I'm the warden in my house about is sleep because I think sleep is so important and my husband maybe doesn't find it as important as I do and so he and my kids can all be staying up way too late even you know on a school day or whatever where they have to be up and I find myself feeling like the warden and I don't like that at all but I feel it's so important for them to get sleep okay this is a tough one. And I was exactly like you. I mean, I was horrible at the beginning with that. And I'm like, so sorry I did all that because, oh my gosh, like, and I knew like if my kids didn't get a good night's sleep, they would be really cranky. And then I would have to deal with them being cranky. And I didn't like that. But if you know how to deal with them when they're cranky, you know, and you can't say, oh, wow, you're really tired. Maybe, you know, I told you I should have gone to bed earlier. Right there's the judgment, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, I, mom, I like, for sure do that all the time. Do that all the time because sleep's a big one in my house, also. Yeah, I, I know, and I'll say it to myself sometimes when I'm really tired. But I, you can't go there. It's more about. There's this great book called The Blessing of the Skin Knee. Yeah, and you know that book. Anyway, it's like Absolutely. her whole philosophy is very in line with this too. Let them say, you know what, sweetie, if you go to bed late you're probably going to be really tired tomorrow so you're saying if this happens this may be the result it's like if you tell a kid don't do this because you're going to get hurt it doesn't mean anything to them mm -hmm. if you say if you do this you may get hurt then they are making the choice and they know they're making the choice and then they see the reaction and if they get hurt then they get hurt and then they know next time to be a little more careful or maybe they don't and they get hurt again and maybe it takes four times but that's okay they're learning and i love that it's consequence there's a natural consequence to right. everything and, natural, and the consequence natural consequence is not like see i told you or right. like we don't go that like we want to mm -hmm. but we don't we shouldn't go there we, then we can just empathize and validate how they feel wow i see you're so tired honey you know do you want me to make you a cup of tea you know, is there anything I can do to make you more comfortable? But again, they also have to be able to get up on their own. And uh -huh. if they don't wake up, 
they don't wake up. You can have that discussion though. I'm not waking you up in the morning. It's your responsibility. And if they're little and they haven't and they need an alarm clock, say, hey, go online. If they're little, do it together. If they're old, go online and pick out an alarm clock. Like, I know you can use your phone, but you know, I don't love having your phone right by your bed because it's not healthy for you. So pick out an alarm clock, put your phone over there. Maybe you can do both, right? But it's your responsibility to wake up on your own. And then I call that getting out of the rescue business. <laughs> so I have a question. In that situation, for say a teenager, middle school, high schooler, would you just let them like miss their bus or be late for school? Or would you sort of employ this tactic on a non-school day? No, I did it. Exactly okay. that. That my husband and I talked about it. My daughter was oversleeping. And she would come in and she would say, I oversaw, can you drive me to school? And it was early, like her school started at like 740 or something, you know, and of course I would get out of bed and I wasn't happy about it. And the drive to school was never pleasant. And finally we're like, this, this isn't good for anybody, you know? And so we gave her the number for a taxi and I said, listen, you know what? You're on your own now that you know, we're not waking you up anymore. If you oversleep, here's the number for the taxi and you pay for it. You know, she was making a lot of money. She tutored and she did all these things. She had a lot of money that she was spending on clothes and accessories. And right. so like spend it on a taxi. You know, yeah. like, not, was, my pro not my problem. I got up and went to school and I didn't, but <gasps> we didn't say it in a punitive, nasty way. We're just like, hey, honey, this is better. And you know what? It was hard the first time that she overslept and we wouldn't let ourselves go in that room. And you know what? And she called the taxi and she didn't say anything to us. And, you know, a few times she did it a few times and it was fine. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, like she's going to be late for school. And I got to hurry and drive her. And I was so I'm like, why, what is she learning from that? Like right. nothing. I was feeling the stress of it. That's not what I do. It's all about helping you, the parent, be happier and more relaxed. So like, why should you put yourself in a situation like that? You're now teaching your kids a process. You're teaching them a life skill as opposed to that day's result of them being in school on time, which really doesn't matter in the scheme of life. Learning to be on time for things is so much more important mm -hmm. than missing a couple of mornings of school. Well, it's, it's funny because this morning my daughter overslept. Um, she was up too late last night. She overslept this morning. I woke her once. I didn't go back to wake her again. She didn't get up when I, she finally got up, rushed to get ready. We made it to school on time this morning, but it, she was so frazzled this morning and I was frazzled because she was frazzled and it just did not set the day in a good way. Right. So maybe you say, did you see how, like tonight, God, we were both so frazzled this morning and I didn't feel good for a lot of the day. I can't, I can't do that. You know, if you can, that's okay. Like, I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but I can't be involved in the process anymore. And so if you can't be ready by such and such a time, then I can't, I can't take you to school. You know, you're going to have to find another way to school. But can, are there taxis? Can she call an Uber or a taxi or something? Um, no, <laughs> she's a little too young. How old is she? He's 14. Okay. And, and, so, I mean, they're not readily available. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so then, then say, let's talk about ways to avoid that from happening, you yeah. know, and help her then learn different ways and say, what do you think you could do? Right. And maybe she said, well, I'm always so tired in the morning. Is I can say, is it just that you're comfy and cozy and you don't want to get up out of bed or are you just exhausted or, you know, what is it that's hard in the morning? Start there, get that awareness piece. Right. Mm -hmm. And then she'll tell you, and then maybe it'll come to the fact that she said, oh, you know what? I probably should go to bed a little more, a little earlier because I need more sleep, you know, and you mm -hmm. can say, yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable, honey. What do you think is a good time for you to go to sleep instead of 
11 when you usually go to sleep what maybe you want to try a half hour earlier or a little bit like and see if that's enough and if it's not like instead of saying you need to go to bed two hours or, right just you're helping her learn to figure this out mm -hmm. which is really so much more important than her being a little frazzled in the morning you're right and because again it gets back to teaching them life skills which is really what we should be doing as parents, right? Keeping them safe right. and loved and all that, of course. But then at some point they're gonna they're gonna leave us. We want to know that they have the skills that they need to survive as an adult. You know, so what I say to every parent is that parenting is not an 18 year engineering project. Right? <laughs> okay, and that's exactly the response I get because you know exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. right? And it never works and it causes conflict and disappointment and wrong expectations and judgment and all this stuff instead if we look at our role as parent as raising resilient self-reliant kids with good problem solving skills and good coping mechanisms then we're doing exactly what you just said we're now saying they're going out into the world and i know and they know that they'll be able to handle whatever it is that comes their way good bad horrible and to me, like, you know, we say you're only as happy as your least happy child, yeah. right? <laughs> right? Uh, I say, why don't you just want to know that instead of saying, I want my kids to be happy all the time, I want to know my kid can handle being unhappy. I want to know my kid mm. can handle frustration and disappointment and anxiety and all the things that are normal, healthy human emotions, even though they don't always feel good, they're really normal. And so, we need to help them learn that they're okay and that they can deal with it. Well, and, and then you don't have to worry about them being happy all the time because you know that even if they're not, they can deal with it. Right. And that really kind of leads into one of the questions that we, I think, both had for you is that as parents, we always want to kind of jump in and rescue our kids when something goes wrong. And we all know that you shouldn't do that, but it's kind of almost like that natural reaction where you just want to go in and solve the problem or fix it for them or punch the other kid that hurt your kid or, you know, whatever it is, your emotions go crazy as a parent, right? So what advice can you offer a parent when something does go wrong um, or what kind of solution instead of just telling your kid what to do or trying to solve it for them? Yeah, so the first thing I say is don't fix it. Like by fixing it, you're taking away an opportunity for your child. And that opportunity for your child is to learn how to deal with adversity. So whatever that thing is. But and what our kids really want from us anyway is this emotional connection. And so say, wow, I could see you were really pretty upset when that happened. Or they come home and they tell you something and you want to go, well, Again, did you do this? Well, maybe you should do this and you should do that and blah, 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 and what the hell? And, you know, all this stuff that they're like, you don't even get what I'm saying. And then they're like angry, you know, or something happens with a teacher, like this teacher was so mean to me today and blah, blah, blah. Our first thing is, well, what did you do? Like, right? All, and <laughs> right? Uh -huh. what did you do is saying, you caused this. I'm judging that. I'm making the judgment that it was your fault. And you know what? In a lot of cases, it probably was their fault. But all we need to do is say, oh, that must have been horrible. Or wow, I, that's really disappointing. Or that sucked, huh? Or what a bummer. Or, like, just validate how they feel. Give them a big hug. Make them a cup of tea. Like, just be as loving and kind as you can. And that's it. Because you know what? They feel if we're doing all that, then they feel like we don't trust them enough to be able to figure things out for themselves. We don't trust them enough to say, okay, I went to the bathroom before practice and I was late for practice and then I didn't get to practice and now I don't get to be in the game, right? That's the whole big thing. And you're thinking, what an idiot, that coach is such an idiot and the coach, da, 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 or why did you go late? Or instead, just say, oh God, that's so disappointing, right? Just tell them, you get how they feel and they're trying to tell you how they feel. Mm -hmm. So it'll take all the fix it stuff out of it. And they know, I can guarantee you the next time they have to go to the bathroom, they're gonna go to practice first and then go to the bathroom. 
they're smart. Our kids are smart. They can figure this stuff out, you know? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, what if it's something more serious where they're really hurting and, or, you know, I have two daughters and there's been a lot of drama over the years, you know, with friends and whatever, like, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, coming to you to share what's happened, maybe looking for advice, maybe not looking for advice. It's hard to know. What do you recommend? In those okay. Times? It's not hard to know about the advice part because all you have to do is say, do you want to talk about do you want to brainstorm some ideas of how to handle this? Or, or I, I hear you in this really, you don't have to ask, like just say, well, let me know if you want to talk about some ways you're thinking about handling this, or if you want to just brainstorm the ideas a little bit. But sometimes they don't, they just want you to know how they're feeling. And then they get pissed off when you start giving suggestions. You know, yeah. I mean, my yeah. daughter actually said to me, I remember this, and this was another like big moment for me. And she's, she was a junior in high school and she was working on something and I, don't know, I came up with the best idea for her. And I, I went in her room and I'm like, Victoria, I have the best idea for you about this. And she's like, mom, stop. And she said, you could have the best idea in the world, but I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take your idea. I'm not, I want to figure this out by myself. Okay. And I was lucky that she was so clear and communicated so nicely to me about it, but it was a moment for me where I realized they do like, just be there and love them. I don't need our help in figuring out. I mean, how did you figure out all your stuff? Probably not by having someone tell you how to figure it out, how to do it. Right. We did it. We do that now. And that's what they want. And the respect piece is so important that like, I knew you would be able to, you know, like say they leave something at home that's important, a musical instrument or a lunch or sports equipment or homework or whatever. And, but you need to tell them up front, hey, you get one shot a quarter or semester mm -hmm. where if you forget something and I'm able to, I will bring it to you. But once, that's it. The other times they're going to come home and, you know, you're going to see that lunch and you've made the lunch. And damn it, I told them like tw or 20 times to put it in our backpack, da, 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 right? And now you're like annoyed, uh -huh. right? Which isn't good for you. And chances are you're going to like take the and run to school. So she has her lunch, you know, and instead you look at that lunch and go, oh, she left her lunch. This is an opportunity for her to learn some coping mechanisms and problem solving skills and resilience. And like, so then you look at all these problems as opportunities, mm. you know? And so when they happen to your kid, again, you can reinforce that and say, oh, you know what? I saw that you left this and I knew, you know, I knew you'd be able to figure it out. What did you end up doing for lunch, honey? Maybe they had to go and borrow money from the front desk. Maybe they moved from their friends. Maybe they bought the school lunch that they never would eat before. And actually, it wasn't so bad, you know, or they were hungry. And you know what? It's okay if they're hungry. They're not going to die. I so. love that. Yes. These are such good ideas. And I think our kids will learn from all of them. These are yeah, all experiences just, that they will learn from. The key is not to be snarky and punitive. The snark of like, oh, yeah, well, you know, maybe you'll remember it next time. You know, all you have to say is, yeah, I saw you left it. I put it in the fridge. So it'll be there for tomorrow. Yeah. And so what do you, as, as parents, when we're in the moment and we're about to make that snarky comment, you just need to like pause and take a deep breath or do, <laughs> you know, as you're trying to make changes and get away from those comments and judgment, any little small strategies on how to, how to get there? Cause a lot of it's what's coming from our mouth really. Well, yeah, I think that you, if you, Pretend you're more of an observer, like, okay, I see that lunch. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? And I would always think, I guess the thing I would think is if I do this, will I be helping my child to develop resilience? Mm -hmm. If I do this, will I help them develop problem solving skills or coping mechanisms or all those, you know, self-reliance, which is so important. And then you could probably going to say, no, I won't be. You know, so then all of a sudden you say, okay, here's an opportunity for my child. Like the problems just immediately turn into these opportunities, which 
that takes all the stress and anxiety away from mm. you mm. as a parent, like that you don't know, you don't have to worry about it anymore. They're going to figure it out. Like, the, you know, at the girl stuff with the girl problems, talk to them, say, Hey, yeah, that must be a bummer. You know, with the forgetting that like, do you want to, and again, I like, because they don't want our ideas really. And they do want to figure things out for themselves. Mm. That's why I love the brainstorming so much because they're not, committing to anything they're not committing to taking your idea just sort of fun and you know if they've never done it before throw out the crazy ideas that aren't going to stick you know just so they get the hang of it and they'll go like mom are you serious and you're like well we're just brainstorming yeah. you know you can put out as crazy an idea as you want and that lightens up the conversation a bit too which i like exactly yeah, yeah. i would keep all of this that way and you know validate like what you went through yeah girls can really be kind of bitchy yep and it's good like you know how did how you know how do you feel about that you know and what a, you can even say do you ever see someone being mean to someone else like start up that conversation you know what do you think about if you said you know it's like when I was in high school there was this one girl and she used to do blah 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 and you know really but I, I was too afraid to say something to her or to defend somebody else but you know I wish I had and I don't know you, there's just so many directions you can go in but the more you put it about yourself or someone else and not them mm -hmm. the more they're going to talk I love that so one congratulations on your upcoming book which Thank you. should be out by the time this episode airs parenting with sanity and joy 101 simple tips so I still have a slew of parenting books from when I started purchasing them 15 years ago when my oldest was born. And I loved how from your first chapter that I read that you're sharing with everyone, there's just short, easy, digestible tips. So can you maybe just talk a little bit about this book and what inspired you to write it and how it's different from many of the other parenting books out yeah, there? Yeah. Yeah. So like, I kind of call it the parenting book for parents who don't have time to read parenting books yes. or don't want to read <laughs> or don't really want to read parenting books. Awesome. Uh, yes. One of those parents had had like this slew of books too. And I would start reading one and I would never get through any of them. But every time I read one of these books, I felt like a loser. I felt like, oh my God, I've already missed the boat. I've been doing everything all wrong. I'm totally screwing up my kids. Like I hated the way they made me feel. There were a couple, like the, Blessing of the Skinny and Siblings Without Rivalry are two books that I love and I always recommend because I think they're great. And I got some really good stuff from that that helped me. But this one is just, it's also very, I wrote it to be so non-judgmental. You're never going to feel that way. And you're going to say, oh yeah, I do that or I can do that. Like people have said, you know, that when they hear these tips, it makes them feel good. It makes them feel good about their parenting. There's some of them are reminders. Some of them are easy things they hadn't thought about, but they're all done in a way. And I'm like, you know what? Pick it up, read a tip, and then put it away and try that one. Like nothing happens. You're not going to make all these changes overnight. And even all the, this is a, this will be a practice learning how to, what you say to your kids in a way that that doesn't sound judgmental and learning how to have the conversations together. It takes time, but these are all like, I think the tips are great. I think they're easy and fun, a lot of them. And I'll just tell you my favorite one is that is tip number one, and that is say yes with joy. I and loved that when I read it. Talk about that. When I read yeah, that. I will, because I love that tip so yeah. much. And I still use it, even though my kids are older. And it doesn't mean say yes all the time. Mm -hmm. It means that when you're going to say yes, and you know you're going to say yes, that you say it like, sure, honey, or I'd be happy to, or I'd love to, you know, give me five minutes and I'd love to help you with that, or I'll drive you here, whatever it is. Because a lot of the time we know we're going to do it and we're like, oh, fine, <laughs> give me five minutes. <laughs> all right. I know, right? <laughs> But they read into that. Right? Totally. Yes. Oh, when when we when we say that, A, we're like, oh, this is such a drag. I can't believe I have to do this. And B, a kid feels kind of crappy about it too, because they're feeling like they're putting you out. And it's like they need your help. Like they can't get in a car and drive themselves to one place or another by themselves, or they can't reach something, or they really need help. 
Yeah. And they're asking for it. But when I'm telling you, when you say, sure, honey, I'd be happy to, you will actually enjoy doing what you're doing. It is amazing. When I started doing that, a, a switch was flipped. It made such a difference. And even now, like driving my kids to the airport, you know, like, no, do I really want to? But now it's like, I get to spend an hour in the car alone with my child and talk to her. And it is really nice, you know, and could we take a walk instead? Would that be better? Yeah, but that wasn't happening. And she needed to get to the airport or anything. It's just like, it really, really, really makes a difference. I, I really love all these tips and I'm super excited to buy your book when it comes out. And I love how you said it's very digestible and non-judgmental which I think is wonderful in a parenting book because no one wants to feel judged as a parent. Right. Exactly. It's and not going to make you want to implement any of the tips if you feel like. No, in it. fact, there's tips that one is don't judge, don't be the judgy parent, mm -hmm. you know, don't judge other people and don't be judgy. Lots of judgy yeah. And ignore and ignore the judgy parents and don't be judgy yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know what's going on with these people. And mm -hmm. listen, Every one of us has gone into a store, been somewhere where we see a parent and a child. And our first thought is probably a little judgy. But yeah. when you know the story behind what's going on, you will realize that there's no, there's no need for judgment. There's probably more need for empathy than anything else. You know, no one knows what's going on in your house. You don't know what's going on in their house. Just let it go. Absolutely. I think this may be one of those books I'm going to have my husband read too, or we could like sort of flip through it together because of yeah. the way it's set up. Because he, he would never sit down and read a parenting book. Right. Um, but this is great. I'm super excited. Leave it in it. the bathroom. <laughs> oh, it'll get ready in like five minutes. It'll get done <laughs> <and> tomorrow. <laughs> so yeah, I'm great sure tip right there. <laughs> I'm sure that all our listeners are going to be so excited to seek you out because you have so much energy and I, I'm just super excited about this conversation. Yes. How can people find you on social media, website? Yeah, so I'm The Parenting Mentor. I'm theparentingmentor.com. Um, my website has lots of information. Also how to buy my book. You can get it through Amazon. You can get it through bookshop.org. You can get it through Barnes and & Noble. And then on Instagram, I'm at the parenting mentor, I give a tip a day. So, you know, not all the, they're not the tips from the book. They're just, you know, a little snippet of just a way to think about something that's going on and really quick and helpful. And um, on Facebook, the same, the parenting mentor. Well, that's awesome. We'll link all of that up in our show notes. Finally, one last question that we'd like to ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? Well, you know what, as I've gotten a little older, <laughs> what it means to me now, and, and especially, you know, I've realized that during the pandemic, how important this is, that I just sort of take the little things that would normally really bother me, and I let them go. And then the little, I find the little things to give me joy, you know, mm -hmm. so where things may be like, you know, before I was in the city and going to the theater and doing this and that and hustle and bustle. Now I kind of come to the space where I'm happy doing just the little things and I don't let things bother me as much. That's a great place to be. Yeah. It is. And such great advice. You know, it's simple. We can all do it, but I, obviously you've had a journey to get there. I love that. I love ending this conversation with that too. So thank you so much, Sue. This has been so much fun. Yeah, it's so fun for me too. Yeah, good. We're excited for your upcoming book. I have lots of parents and friends that I know will love this book as well. I think it's going to be one of those you buy a bunch of and then you keep it in your little gift stash. To yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great gift book. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook. 
where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.